And I'm sure you know the name, but not the face. You will see the face today, but another 10 years perhaps. It has taken us two years to convince his secretary that he should come to Davis. <laughs> his secretary is a lioness that counts every second of this man's life. I wrote to her, we want him for two days. She said, no way. For a day, she said, no. How much? A couple of hours. So we've been negotiating <laughs> for the last two years. And now that I'm going to tell you what he's doing with his time, you realize why his, his pro uh, program is so compact. He got his bachelor's in Nebraska. He is a Nebraska native. He got his master's and PhD in Michigan State University. And he did one year of postdoc in Stanford, and then he hit the job market. Several different places. During the course of these activities, he has 328 publications. The highlights of them are the two publications that he had with my lab, of course. <laughs> and that's why he's here, otherwise he would not have come. He has 12 more publications in press. He has 33 patents. He has had 369 invited semi seminar speakers and 294 national and international meetings. I don't know how old he is. I think he's working at night or the art, you know, I don't know what's happening. So overall, he has in between, between all these activities and papers and patents and all that, he, he interacts with NPR for fuel from yeast. He has YouTube programs on development of drugs. He's been on Bloomberg television on microbes that can convert waste to fuel. He's been on Discovery Channel for future of energy. I can go on and on and on and on. Suffice to say that the positions he's currently holding are as follows. Very few, not much. Distinguished professor of biochemistry and uh, biochemical engineering in Berkeley. He is the associate di lab director and senior scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. He is the chief executive officer and vice president for fuel synthesis. And he is director of synthetic biology engineering research center. I'm glad we have you for the limited time that we have. You better start. I think Olga is going to be here and say, time over, Davis, let him go. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. So, Jake, you Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I don't know what got into Olga, but um, probably me. Um, okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about engineering microbes to produce, uh, this is pretty loud, to produce uh, chemicals of, of various sorts. Uh, and uh, probably don't have to tell any of you that we get uh, nearly everything we use on a day-to-day -day basis from petroleum that we bring up from underground. Of course, we refine it. Uh, we, we turn it into fuels, and when we burn those in our car, we put a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. Um, you probably know that a lot of the chemicals we use on a regular basis come from petroleum. And, and I'll talk about this in just a minute. Um, and a lot of the, the precursors for drugs also come from petroleum. And, and the list is vast. I culled this down from a much longer list so that you could at least see some of the words. But you know, besides uh, the fuels that we use, things like uh, shoes and dashboards and clothes and denture adhesive and all these things come from petroleum. And if you just look at a typical barrel of oil, roughly 80 to 85 percent of that barrel is used for producing fuels. And the other 15 to 20 percent is used for producing all of the other chemicals that we use. And the value in that 15 to 20 percent is roughly equal to the value of the 80 to 85 percent. So that tells you that those chemicals that are made from petroleum have a much higher value per pound or per volume than do the fuels. Of course, the fuels are some of the lowest priced things um, that we have available to us. But in this barrel of oil, are two of our largest industries, the energy industry and the chemicals industry. Now, we'd like to have a renewable fu future. 
Um, we'd like to be able to produce a lot of these same products um, from renewable resources like sugarcane or corn or cellulosic biomass. And of course, if you produce fuels from that cellulosic biomass, then you're recycling carbon and you're not adding additional carbon to the atmosphere. Um, but some of the challenges are producing uh, all of these kinds of molecules in the same ways and in the same types that we've gotten used to using. Now, if you look at the volume and the value, not too surprising. At the uh, highest volume, of course, are the fuels. The lowest volume are the drugs. And the value is just inversely correlated. The highest value things are the drugs, and the lowest value are the fuels. Now, generally, when we think about replacement, uh, replacing these things with alternatives, um, we're, we're pretty sure that we don't want to replace drugs with things that are kind of like them. Uh, we generally like to replace drugs with things that are exactly like them. In fact, we have the whole FDA to make sure that that happens. Um, but we generally think, well, gosh, uh, with chemicals, we could replace those with things that are kind of like them. And uh, with fuels, we even have a wider variety of things because, after all, they just have to burn. Um, it turns out that the flexibility for substitution is, is just about as limited for fuels as it is for drugs, and certainly is the case for, for uh, chemicals. And the reason is, is simple. If we just take this plastic bottle, um, the maker of this is, is selling, you know, filling it with water, and this is going to go sit on a shelf, and it's going to go uh, be taken around in a truck, and uh, the people who bottle, put the water in here want to make sure that that plastic behaves the same every time. And so they don't want a plastic that kind of is like the plastic that they've been using for the last 70 years, or however long this plastic has been around. They want the exact same thing. And so if you want to substitute a new kind of plastic, plan on spending about a billion dollars. It takes about a billion dollars for any new molecule you want to introduce. We know that for drugs. It's, I think the number is 1.2 billion now on average for every new drug. It turns out to introduce things like plastics, new plastics, um, something that might uh, recycle better, something that might biodegrade. You've got to make that plastic. You get, a, get it around to every plastic bottle maker. They've got to futz with it. They've got to formulate it. Um, it's going to cost about a billion dollars. So um, that's why I made this line pretty thin, because the substitution that we can make is pretty thin. And what that means is that if you are a person that's focusing on making renewable replacements or replacements from renewables, then you've got to focus on making drop-ins, things that can drop in to a tank that can drop into a plastic bottle, um, that can drop in as drugs. Sometimes the exact same molecule. So I'm going to talk today about engineering, molecule, uh, engineering microbes to produce those exact same molecules, or very close substitutes when it comes to fuels. So I'm going to tell three stories. I'm going to tell a, an old story, and I'm just going to tell you some brief highlights on the old story, then I'm going to tell you a slightly newer story on fuels, and then we'll end with producing chemicals. So uh, first about uh, producing drugs. So um, I'm going to start off with uh, this guy. His name's George. I met him three years ago when I went to Africa. I went to Nairobi for a conference on antimalarial drugs, and then I went to Kisumu, um, uh, which is a town on Lake Victoria where 80% of the population has malaria. And it was a day that was very similar temperature to what it is outside. I wasn't dressed like this, but George was. Uh, George uh, had a, a jacket on and pants on. It was very warm outside, um, and it was pretty clear he was ill. Um, he was in this clinic. It's a state-run clinic. And uh, the typical home looks like this. It's hard to see, but they're mud. Um, and you can see that the roofs are not in great condition. And as I said, 80% of the population has malaria. So when uh, I went into the clinic uh, to visit with a nurse, she knew right away that George had malaria. She pricked his finger, put a drop on this little device that she had just gotten, followed it up with a couple of drops of buffer. Um, a few seconds later, she had the readout. Um, you can see there's two lines on there. There's one at the top here, the control line, and then the test line right here. And that means that George has malaria. 
So she weighed George, and then she pulled out a blister pack of coartem. This is a drug made by Novartis. It contains artemisinin, and I'll tell you about artemisinin in just a minute. She gave George the first tablet, and then she turned to his brother, who had brought him in, and said, give him uh, a tablet every 12 hours, and he ha must take the full set of six tablets. She repeated the instructions and set him on his way. And then she turned to me and she said, by the time he gets to this third tablet, he's going to feel great. He's going to look like normal. And so his mom is going to give him that third tablet, and then she's going to tuck the other three tablets away in her drawer. Because maybe the next time he gets malaria, which could be just in a matter of months, she won't have access to these drugs. The clinic will be out of them, and she'll need them for George. And there's some issues that come with that. So just a little bit more about malaria. Um, these are numbers from 2011. They're pretty similar to what they are now. Uh, roughly uh, somewhere around a third of uh, the world's population is at risk of getting malaria at any one time. Somewhere between 200 and 250 million people have malaria, and every year somewhere just shy of a million people die of malaria. Two-thirds are children under the age of five. There's a drug um, that's in coartem. It's called artemisinin, and it comes from this plant, uh, wormwood or sweet annie. Um, it's got a great history, and in fact, um, last week, the Nobel Prize um, uh, was given to this woman, UU2, for the rediscovery of artemisinin. It goes, if you, I don't know if any of you read about the history, um, but it goes way back to about 160 B, 168 BC, where it was first used for treating hemorrhoids and then fevers, and then completely forgotten. In 1967, Mao sent his medical corps um, and one of whom was Yu Yu Tu, out to find a treatment for malaria because the Chinese were fight, fighting in Vietnam, malaria was rampant, and the drugs that were available were no longer effective. She poured through the medical literature, right here. Um, yeah. Uh, she found a description of this, um, uh, and evidently, if you, if you believe the New York Times um, from last week, uh, the, the methods that, that she found in the literature didn't quite work, and so she went through a series of solvents until she found the best solvent. Um, in 1972, they had uh, described the active ingredient, and in 2004, the World Health Organization recommended it as the drug of choice. Few challenges with artemisinin. Um, one is price and availability. One is quality and the other is resistance. Um, so this is how uh, we get artemisinin right now. It's um, produced in a plant. We purify it from the plant um, and uh, using solvents. You get artemisinin, and then that's chemically converted uh, into uh, these various derivatives, and artesanate is the active ingredient in coartem. Now, if you look in the plant uh, on the leaf, uh, the artemisinin is not everywhere. It's actually stored in trichomes that are on the leaf of the plant. Um, they're slightly invaginated in Artemisia annua. I wouldn't know a trichome if I saw one. Um, well, I know one here, but on another plant. Um, but I understand that these are hard to get access to because they're um, down in these crevices on Artemisia. Um, but this is there are producer cells under uh, those trichomes that produce the artemisinin, and then it's stored in the trichome. This is how it's produced right now. Um, they get seeds, they seed them in greenhouses, then they take the small plants out to the fields, they plant them, they grow over a growing season, they grow to be eight feet tall, then farmers come in and chop it down, they put it onto uh, tarps and let it dry in the sun, and then they shake the leaves off of it, and then they run those through a series of sieves um, to get the fines, the leaves that have uh, the artemisinin, and then they put it in bags, take it into the factory, and extract it. Now, here's one of the challenges um, that's illustrated here. Uh, this shows the price uh, in red and the availability of artemisinin over the years. Uh, so uh, introduced in 2004, price immediately shoots up to about $1,100 a kilogram. Farmers see this. They realize that they can plant artemisinin 
uh, Artemisia annua and, and make a profit. So they start planting like crazy. They overplant. There's an oversupply. By 2007, the price crashes. They quit planting. And then there's, again, so it goes through these cycles of price, high price, low price, high availability, low availability. And this is one of the challenges that we wanted to try to get around. And of course, they have alternatives, right? So if you just look at, um, this is again 2011, but uh, they had a lot of alternatives, food, in fact, where they could earn more than uh, when they plant Artemisia and produce Artemisinin. And that's one of the challenges that we're facing this coming year because there was a bumper crop in 2014. There's an oversupply right now, and farmers are um, running away from it in droves. So we wanted to try to um, get over these swings in price and availability by um, producing in an organism that would um, allow us to do, produce quickly and be able to ramp up fermenters um, very fast. I, I want to go back to this slide and just point one thing out that I didn't mention. You see there's this um, period here of two years between the peak in the price and the peak in the planting. Um, and, and that's very important because it takes about 18 months to two years in order for pharmaceutical companies to decide how much they're going to need for them to predict the availability, for them to get contracts with farmers, large plantations, seeds to the farmers, seeds planted, grown, harvested artemisinin into the factories to produce the artemisinin combination therapies. 18 months to two years. We also wanted to reduce that. So the answer for us was to engineer microbes to produce a precursor to artemisinin called artemisinic acid, and then convert that directly into these derivatives that are used in the drugs. Now, artemisinic acid is not artemisinin, but it turns out, and I'll show you this in just a minute, that uh, the plants, depending on the growing season, produce both artemisinin and artemisinic acid. And if you look at the leaves at the top, which are the newest leaves, they have more artemisinic acid and less artemisinin. And if you look at the leaves at the bottom of the plant, the oldest leaves, they have more artemisinin and less artemisinic acid. And therefore, the plant is doing this conversion inside. And this, in fact, inspired a method um, based on what the plants are saying. So the first step uh, was to engineer the precursor pathway. Um, and uh, we did this by engineering um, a pathway called the mevalonate pathway. It's a well-known pathway in you and me. It's responsible for cholesterol biosynthesis. And there's all kinds of drugs that target this pathway. And uh, a lot's known about the pathway. So we engineered the pathway in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, increased the production substantially to the point where we could produce a morphodyne, the first uh, committed intermediate in the pathway. There was a gene known for that step. And so we put it into yeast, and we could produce a morphodyne. But we didn't have the enzymes for the next steps in the pathway that would produce the alcohol, the aldehyde, and the acid. So we had to go in and find those enzymes. So we went on an expedition, and we decided to look uh, in the place where the artemisinin is produced. Now, there's a lot of genes in plants. I don't have to tell you your you know, plant biology group. Um, but uh, there was no genome sequenced for this plant, not even uh, a functional CD, a good CDNA library at the time. So um, we learned how to uh, separate these trichomes from the leaves and get them relatively pure. And then we made a cDNA library of those producer cells that are at the bottom, because if they're producing the artemisinin, they must enri be enriched for the enzymes and therefore the, for the transcripts. And then it would uh, shorten our hunting expedition. Now, um, to try to hone in on the enzymes that are doing this activity, um, we, in fact, looked at sunflower and lettuce. And it turns out there was a cDNA library for those that was created here at Davis. Um, uh, and was funded by the National Science Foundation. And there are metabolites in sunflower and lettuce that look like those in Artemisia annua. And therefore, they must have similar enzymes. So we used a tree uh, against uh, sunflower and lettuce with the cDNA library that we had created for um, Artemisia annua. And that allowed us to go in and hone in on genes that would do this. And a whole series of miracles happened about this time. The first one was that um, the first gene we went after was the right one. Second miracle was that it did all three steps, um, not just the first uh, oxidation. We had thought it would just do the first oxidation. 
It's not unprecedented in the literature, but it certainly shortened our timelines. Um, and this is something that was funded by the Gates Foundation. Every quarter we had to report in how we were doing. And um, this got us nine months ahead, which was really great. Um, the, the, the third thing that happened that was really a surprise to us is where the artemisinin, artemisinic acid ended up. Um, we looked for it in the broth. It wasn't in the culture broth. We looked for it inside the cells. It wasn't inside the cells. Yet we knew we were producing it because when we sacrificed the entire culture and ran it on a mass spec, we could see the artemisinic acid. Well, it turns out that artemisinic acid is not as toxic as artemisinin, but it's toxic enough that yeast induced pumps. And those pumps pumped the artemisinic acid outside the cell. And because of the pH of the medium, it precipitated on the outside of the cell. And this gave us the perfect purification because we didn't have to separate it from all of the other contaminating metabolites that we would have had to separate it from had we had to lyse the cells to get it out. And in fact, in the large scale production, this gave a really excellent purification um, because it crystallizes out in pure form. And you can see it here. This is uh, from Amaris. Um, they uh, actually got it, uh, it's produced in such large quantities that it crystallizes out of the culture medium. You can see it right there um, on the side of the shake flask. Well, um, Amherst took the microbe that we built. They um, made an industrial strength microbe, completely rebuilt it on the inside. Uh, and uh, then we turned it over to Sanofi. Um, we actually licensed it to them. And that was the result of uh, a proposal process where 12 pharmaceutical companies applied to get a license to this. Um, they scaled it up, uh, and uh, the production facility is in Eastern Europe at a company called Hova Pharma. And uh, once that was scaled up, then they went after the next step, and that is to convert artemisinic acid to artemisinin. If you remember, I told you that parts of the plant have more artemisinic acid, other parts of the plant have more artemisinin. Um, if the plant is subjected to a lot of cloudy days, it turns out that it'll produce more artemisinic acid than artemisinin. And so there must be something about light and those trichomes. And this actually inspired um, some uh, work on light-catalyzed reactions. This is in the laboratory where they used light to convert the artemisinic acid into artemisinin. This is the full-scale production facility in uh, northern Italy where they're actually uh, converting the artemisinic acid that's produced in Eastern Europe um, to artemisinin. And uh, they then tablet it in Morocco and send it to Africa. And as of May, um, they had shipped 15 million treatments. Uh, and they'll have the capacity to ship on the order of 100 to 150 million treatments every year, which is roughly half the world's needs. And this is um, one of the blister packs that went out. And um, they've already reduced uh, the number of tablets to three, which is a bonus. Um, and if we can give it away, um, then people won't have to worry about the source for it. OK. So I've told you the story um, quickly about uh, producing artemisinin. I want to talk about the other end of the spectrum, and that is producing fuels. Just as we had finished this project, um, there was um, a real worry about the source of our fuels. Uh, the prices of oil had hit $150 a barrel. Um, the US is importing two thirds of its petroleum. Um, and uh, President Bush um, uh, launched an effort to produce renewable fuels. Oh, how times have changed. Now, <clears throat> the challenge um, with renewable fuels um, is that the only fuel that we really had available, well, we've had a couple of fuels, they're, they're mainly alcohols and things like ethanol. And ethanol is great. We use it here in California. We blend it in our gasoline up to 10%. But that's the limit. We can't put more in there because there's a blend limit. And uh, you'll invalidate the warranty on your car unless you have a flex fuel car. And then you can use up to E85, 85% ethanol. But most of the country doesn't have flex fuel cars. Um, and so we're hitting a blend limit. In fact, we have more ethanol than what we know what to do with. And on top of it, we have what's called a renewable fuel standard, which means that Oil companies basically have to buy this renewable stuff, and they have to um, put it into fuels. And the challenge is that if you've only got ethanol to blend in to 10% of gasoline, then it's pretty limited. What we really need are hydrocarbon fuels that are renewable that look and behave exactly like the fuels we get from petroleum. And that was our challenge. How do we do this? So the first thing we did is we looked at all the molecules in gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. And there's lots of molecules. Um, and then we match those up with microbial and plant metabolism. 
and said, which ones can we produce? Well, you can see some alcohols up here. Um, these are alcohols with alkyl groups that are longer than ethanol. So that means that you can, they're more readily blendable with gasoline. Um, but you'll see that all of these molecules are pretty short and have lots of branches, relatively speaking. Um, and that's the case with gasoline. Uh, in fact, this is 224-trimethylpentane or isooctane. And when you drive up to the pump, you're essentially getting um, uh, the octane rating, which is the amount of isooctane, kind of, that's in that gasoline or isooctane behavior. Now, if you look at the diesels and jet fuels, they have these long alkyl groups. But if you had all straight chain alkanes, um, they would become waxes, in fact, at pretty high temperature in the tank. And so you need some branches in them. Um, but the challenge is if you have too many branches, then you lose the diesel-like behavior. So long alkyl groups, few branches in diesels and jets, uh, and in gasoline, short alkyl groups um, with lots of branches. So that was our challenge. How do we produce these molecules? So I'm going to talk about producing these molecules. Now, the first are these long alkyl chains that you find in diesel and jet fuels. And we can get these. We get these now from uh, oils, from plants. Um, and uh, the, the challenge with at least these two plants is that um, they're not very productive per acre. Um, palm oil on the other hand, is very productive per acre. Now, two weeks ago, I was in Singapore, and we landed, and you couldn't see any of the buildings. Um, the, the air quality had hit over 300, and they were sending all the kids home from school um, uh, to just stay home and it, keeping people from going out because in Indonesia and Malaysia, they're burning down the rainforest so they can plant palm oil as fast as they can. Um, and it's completely unregulated, and there's peat under the rainforests, and so the fires never go out. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a disaster. So, so this is a real disaster. The other challenge with these is that even if they weren't, even if this wasn't an environmental disaster, um, you can't use it directly out of there. You've got to do some chemistry on it. So uh, we wanted to be able to produce diesel directly from sugar um, without having to do any other chemistry. Um, so uh, how you get these long alkyl groups is from fatty acid biosynthesis. This is a, a very shortened version of fatty acid biosynthesis. The fatty acids make the lipids in the membrane, of course. If you feed cells fatty acids, they'll take them up and they'll incorporate them into lipids and use them as carbon sources. They're very conservative with these pathways because they're expensive. So if you look in medium, there's almost no free fatty acids. However, if you make some changes to the metabolism, you add in a thioesterase to get the fatty acid off the synthase, and then you put a CoA onto it using FAD-D, and if you have an ethanol pathway inside the cell and an acyl transferase, you can make these fatty acid ethyl esters. And we showed this several years ago that you could do this. And the great thing about these, and this is again coming back to the transport issue, is that the cells produce the fuel um, they secrete the fuel. This is E. coli in here swimming in its broth, and these are blebs of diesel that uh, the E. coli has produced, and they phase separate. So when you make ethanol in a fermenter, it's like making a mixed drink because you're mixing the ethanol and the uh, uh, broth together, and then you have to use uh, distillation to get the ethanol pure before you can put it in a tank. In this case, it's more like making a vinaigrette, and it just phase separates. It isn't quite this easy in the large scale fermenters. You actually run it through a large scale centrifuge, um, a cream separator, uh, and uh, you get your fuel out. And if you've engineered uh, the chemistry inside the cells, you can use the fuel as is. Now, I mentioned branches. And I just want to illustrate how important branches are, because it's going to dominate the rest of my talk on fuel. So, Here's um, a methyl ester of pentadecanoic acid. This is very similar to the diesel we were making. It has a melt point of about 18 C. If you just put a methyl branch on the very end of it, you drop it about 12 degrees. That's pretty great. If you put it one more carbon in, you drop it another 12 degrees. So you're starting to get things that you could use in cold temperatures um, and, and maybe even high in the altitude. Um, if you put a branch in the middle or a couple of branches on it, like farnesane, which is Amherst's diesel, you get extremely 
extremely low melting points. And this is almost a perfect diesel and jet fuel. Um, so the first thing you want to do is maybe put some branches on the end. Um, I mentioned how good this branch in this anti-iso branch is on the fatty acid. So we wanted to build a pathway to do this. You start with branched chain uh, amino acids. You decarboxylate them, and then you use them as the starting material to start um, the fatty acid biosynthetic pathway. And then you can produce the various derivatives that you might want to use as fuels. It turns out it's not quite that easy that you have to overexpress all these genes here shown in blue. It was a huge um, uh, pathway engineering feat, um, but you get these uh, branch chain uh, two carbons in from the middle. Now, you can't get pure um, anti-iso fatty acids because the cell can't stomach that because these get incorporated into the membrane as well. Um, this is the, the composition of the native uh, E. coli free fatty acids if you're overproducing them and they come out in the medium. When you get these anti-iso fatty acids produced, you get a mixture of anti-iso fatty acids, but that's fine. Fuels are mixtures of lots of molecules and you don't have to have a pure anti-iso branch. You just have to have enough in it that you change the melt temperature, um, that you break up the, the ordering of these fatty acid chains. Now, um, I'm going to um, talk about uh, another biosynthetic pathway for producing these very low melt point fuels um, like bisabolane and farnesane. Now, these come from the isoprenoid biosynthetic pathway. This is the pathway that produces artemisinin. And the great thing about this pathway is that you can produce C5s, C10s, C15s, 20s, and higher. Now, for fuels, the only ones that are important are the 5, 10s, and 15s. Well, it turns out those 5s, things like isopentanol, is a great gasoline replacement. It's got 96% of the uh, energy density of gasoline um, can be substituted directly. The monoterpenes have been explored as jet fuels. Um, things like limonene and pinene. They smell really great, and uh, they'll make really great uh, jet fuels. But I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the sesquiterpenes, because um, the sesquiterpenes, as it turns out, like farnesane, like bisabolane, make great diesels. So when it comes to sesquiterpenes, you've got a huge number to choose from. Plants produce a wide variety of sesquiterpenes. Now, for diesels, you don't want too many branches and you don't want too much cyclic nature to the molecule. So you wouldn't want something like this or like this. Here's farnesane, great diesel, great jet fuel. Here's bisabolane, a molecule that we went after at JBay. Um, when you uh, can produce enough of it biologically and you send it off for testing, it has almost identical properties to number two diesel except it has a much lower cloud point, which is great, and that means that it could also be used as a jet fuel. So we had to have a synthase. So um, we went looking for synthases. You can find bisabolane synthases in a variety of organisms. Arabidopsis has one. Um, pine trees have them. The best one came out of grand fir. Um, and in fact, we found that for many of the syntheses that we've used in E. coli and yeast, the best ones, at least in terms of production, come from uh, grand fur. Now, um, this synthase is uh, a really interesting synthase. It's got three domains to it. We discovered this when we, were, when we had cloned the gene and found these three uh, domains. Uh, and it's even borne out by this crystal structure. We've tried to engineer the enzyme to get rid of these domains, and, and we don't get a functional protein. Um, now, one of the challenges when you produce these molecules is um, uh, producing too much or too little. And it's illustrated here, and this is an old um, uh, graph from one of our, our 2003 papers, um, where we showed that if you use FPP, uh, too much of it, um, the cells won't grow because they need farnesyl pyrophosphate for growth. Likewise, if you upregulate up -regulate this pathway and don't use it fast enough the cells won't grow as well. And that's shown here, where the more FPP they produce, the slower the cells grow. And it turns out that it's toxic to them. So in order to produce these kinds of molecules, you have to have careful balance of the pathway. You have to balance the production of the intermediate and the utilization of the intermediate. Now, how we typically do this when we're engineering pathways 
is we uh, use inducible promoters. We'll use a different inducible promoter for the production pathway than for the utilization pathway. This works great in the lab, but it's not a great way to engineer a cell for use in uh, a production facility because you can't use inducers. They're just too expensive, especially with something like a fuel. Ideally, we'd have auto-regulatory pathways where you can sense the level of that intermediate, down-regulate production, or up-regulate utilization, or both, and therefore balance barnacle pyrophosphate. But unfortunately, to our knowledge, there's no sensor for farnesyl pyrophosphate that regulates gene expression. So we needed to find one. So Rob Dahl, who was a graduate student in my lab, said, well, we've got toxicity, and that will allow us to find promoters that are turned up or turned down in the presence of farnesyl pyrophosphate. So we built two cell lines, one that produced a lot of farnesyl pyrophosphate, a second that produced the same amount but utilized it. So you'd have high amounts and low amounts inside the cells. We did DNA arrays back in the old days um, and found, um, uh, first, let me just again show you the growth. Here's, here's where we're producing a lot of farnesyl pyrophosphate but not using it. The cells stop growing at a certain OD. When you utilize it at the same rate that you're producing it, the cells grow normally. You can then use this um, to look for stresses. He found about 40 genes that were upregulated or downregulated in the presence of farnesyl pyrophosphate. And then he took those promoters, two of those, and used them to dynamically regulate this pathway. So he took two promoters that were down-regulated, get this GAD-E, in the presence of farnesyl pyrophosphate, and one that was upregulated in the presence of farnesyl pyrophosphate, built a system to produce and utilize FPP, and compared that to the inducible system where we're using inducible promoters. Here's the main data that I want to show you. So here's the system with the inducible promoters. We're getting, in this case, 700 mg per liter of uh, the isoprenoid. In this case, with the uh, promoters that are auto-inducible, no intervention, no human intervention at all. They turn on and regulate themselves um, in response to farnesyl pyrophosphate. You get a doubling in the production. Pretty good. OK, so um, I've told you about uh, a few stories about producing drugs and fuels. I want to end my talk today um, and uh, talking about chemicals. Now, um, if you remember, uh, I was talking about this uh, 15 to 20 percent of a barrel of oil is used to produce all the chemicals that we use. And just to illustrate um, how prevalent petroleum is in our lives, if you didn't know it already, um, if you didn't drive here, for instance, um, if you just take a, a minute and look around the room at everything in the room here. Um, so uh, the carpet on the floor is nylon, and that's made from petroleum. Um, the, that's probably nylon in the fabric on the chair. There's certainly paint on the chair that's made from petroleum. The paint on the walls and the ceiling. The ceiling tiles are probably mostly made from some type of petroleum. Uh, the paint on those uh, lights, et cetera. So plastic and all of these devices, um, made from petroleum. It's everywhere. Everywhere. Um, I've already shown you this. A lot of different things. So if you just now take all of those different products and you look at the major molecules that go into making those products, you come up with a, a not so big list. Um, lots of aromatics. You've got some diacids here. Um, a lot of olefins. Um, some ketones. Uh, some hydroxy acids. Um, all of these make, or these um, things make all the products that we use on a regular basis. So I've told you stories about um, two hydrocarbon biosynthetic pathways, the fatty acid biosynthetic pathway and the isoprenoid biosynthetic pathway. And those are pretty useful for producing a lot of molecules, but there are some molecules they can't make. And so we wanted to make some of these molecules. And um, we wondered how we were going to do things like these diacids um, and control the chain length exactly and these hydroxy acids and, and be able to produce a variety of those. Well, it turns out there's another hydrocarbon biosynthetic pathway. It's not really known as a hydrocarbon biosynthetic pathway. We usually think about it for producing antibiotics, the polyketides. And, and um, I'm sure everyone in this room has some experience with polyketide at least once in your life um, in terms of taking an antibiotic. Um, 
these uh, are really complicated molecules, and some of these complications on these molecules are really great things to have, particularly when you're trying to produce chemicals. Now, a little bit about these polyketide synthases. They are enormous. The, this is a polyketide synthase for producing erythromycin, the core to erythromycin. Um, it contains three proteins, one, two, three. Um, so they're huge enzymes. Each one of these circles represents a, an enzyme activity. So it's basically enzymes that are strung together to make these huge multifunctional proteins. Um, they have a load module that loads a starting material, and then it's extended by two carbons as it goes down each extension module until it gets to the end and then it's terminated. As I mentioned, each one of these circles is called a domain, and those domains have an enzyme activity. And this is the ba basic PKS when you boil it down. It's got a load domain, an extension domain, and a termination domain. Load something like a CoA onto it, in this case acetyl-CoA or a malonyl-CoA or methylmalonyl-CoA. Loads another CoA onto the extension domain, then it undergoes a Claisen condensation. You get a CO2 off. You get it extended by two carbon units on the backbone with some R group extended onto it. And then the thioesterase cleaves it off, and you get an acid. Now, if there's a keto reductase group there, then you don't end up with this keto. In fact, it reduces it to an alcohol before it cleaves it off. If there's a keto reductase and a dehydratase, then you reduce the keto to an alcohol, and then you dehydrate, and you get a double bond. And if you've got a keto reductase, a dehydratase, and an enoyl reductase, you reduce it, you dehydrate it, and you reduce it again. You get the alkane off. Now, the crystal structures for parts of these have been known, but just uh, last year did we get a structure for an entire um, uh, module, and that's shown here, one of the simplest modules. They're huge, um, and this ACP is what takes the substrate around to different parts of the enzyme. And this just shows the, um, how the enzyme works. The ACP is basically shuttling it around to each one of the enzyme activities until it goes on and takes it to the next um, module. It's like it's an assembly line. Now, what's really great about these things, they have lots of functionality. And different uh, domain, different modules have different chemical groups that they'll add onto those growing chains. So this gives us huge complexity that we can put into these molecules. So we wanted to start to produce things. What about polyesters, some of the largest commodity chemicals um, that are used? Well, polyesters are made from making an ester. So you need an, an acid and an alcohol. And here's some typical hydroxy acids that get but we might want to uh, make. How are we going to be able to make these? Well, if you remember, I told you about the erythromycin synthase that produces this core in erythromycin. It was shown many years ago that you could move this TE up here, and you could truncate this molecule early and get off a much smaller molecule. We asked the question, could we move the TE up even farther and get a hydroxy acid off? So the first thing we did is we took a module um, from lipomycin, PKS, that we knew would load a variety of starter molecules onto it. And we first tested its ability to load different starters, and we found that it could load a variety, three, four, five, six carbons, onto the front end of the PKS. We took the next module, the extension module, and then we added a thioesterase to it from that DEBS polyketide synthase, the erythromycin core. And in fact, we were able to show that we could produce a variety of hydroxy acids. But all of them have the methyl group here, because that's what's specified in this enzyme. So the question is, can we change that? Well, it was shown a few years ago that by changing the acyl transferase, this specifies what gets loaded. And so if you change the acyl transferase, in this case, this was again done on this DEBS polyketide synthase. If you change it, you could get the desmethyl product. So we wanted to see if we could do this. Change the AT to something that would specify a malonyl-CoA rather than a methylmalonyl-CoA. Well, it turns out in all of those 
operations where they had engineered the PKS. They basically got a very feeble PKS that wouldn't work. So Satoshi Yazawa, a talented postdoc in my lab, said, well, they've made the cuts in the wrong places. They made the cuts right here. And you can see from these new crystal structures that this isn't the full AT, that the full AT is really here. And it's just a problem with how it's annotated. And that we really need to make the cuts here. So he made a series of cuts. He tested out all of those. And he found out that, in fact, if you make the cut here, as they have done traditionally, you don't get activity or not much activity. But if you include both what's called the KS AT linker and the post AT linker, that you get very high activity. And when he did this, he got all of these different desmethyl products. And these, it turns out, polymerize much better um, into the various polyesters. Now, ketones are another product that we'd like to produce. And Satoshi had the very interesting observation that in his reaction in vitro, if he just leaves out NADPH, then this ketoreductase can't function. And you get a keto acid. Well, this is extremely unstable. All you have to do is look at it wrong, and the carbon dioxide comes off. And because you've got an ethyl group here, you get the um, ethyl ketones. Great, we can produce ethyl ketones. If you knock out the ketoreductase activity by just making a point mutation in the active site, you can get this to go in vivo, even though there's a lot of NADPH present. And if you use his trick to change the AT, so that it no longer specifies methylmalonyl-CoA, but specifies malonyl-CoA. And when this CO2 comes off, you get methyl ketones. And some of these are high volume um, solvents that are used. Some of them are also some interesting fragrances. Now, the last molecule I want to talk about is um, diacid. Diacids, like adipic acid, are widely used in production of nylon. It's one of the largest commodity chemicals. We wanted to be able to produce diacids. Now, it turns out that adipic acid, while it's one of the largest of the diacids used, is not the only one. C9s, C11s, C13s are used um, in things in, in uh, high temperature polymers. Uh, Andrew Hagen, who was a graduate student in my lab, wanted to build a PKS that would do this. So we first needed, he in, envisioned, uh, an AT that would load succinyl-CoA. We'd extend it by two carbons, completely reduce it, and then knock it off with a thioesterase. Sounded simple. Six years later, he had succeeded. Um, and I need to tell parts of the story, because after six years, he deserves it. Um, he started with the Borelidin PKS. There aren't that many PKSs that leave a, an acid group on them, but we knew this was the right one. Um, but it doesn't start with exactly the right acid. It starts with this interesting starting material. So the first thing he had to do was just take a fraction of this PKS, the load and the first extension, and test it to see if it would load um, succinyl-CoA. So he tested it with these various um, starter materials. And the, uh, the, the uh, width of the arrow tells the activity. And here's the original, the native starting material. And here's succinyl-CoA. It works even better on the succinyl-CoA than on the original starting material. So there he had something that would load. But when it extended it, it left a hydroxyl in that position. And we knew that we had to get rid of that hydroxyl. And the reason it left the hydroxyl is that all it had is a ketoreductase. So in principle, what we needed to add was a dehydratase and an enoyl reductase. Unfortunately, it's not really worked out how you can add these individual domains to the module. So we do surgery on what's called the reductive domain. It's uh, an entire group of these domains that work together. So he brought them in from four different antibiotic clusters. He substituted them in for the ketoreductase. And he found one that would work and would give him adipic acid when it was cleaved off with a TE. Now, it's tiny, tiny amounts of adipic acid. We have a lot more work to do. But it's a start. Now, what's really great about this synthase is all you have to do, all you have to do is duplicate this extension domain right after the first extension domain, and you get a C8. If you duplicate it twice, you get a C10. And if you duplicate it three times, you get a C12. 
So we've got the makings of synthases that can produce a variety of these acids. So um, a lot of work went into this from a lot of people in my laboratory. The first story was done both in my laboratory and at Amherst, and it was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and licensed by Sanofi. Um, the work in the second part of my talk uh, was accomplished in two different institutes, the Synthetic Biology Engineering Research Center and the Joint Bioenergy Institute, and they're funded by the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks for your time and attention. So one of the prevailing things about all the molecules you talked about today is that we're looking at carbon and oxygen manipulation. Why have we not seen carbon nitrogen manipulation? Um, uh, well, you mean why you haven't you seen it from me? Or in general. Yeah. Uh, well, you haven't seen it from me because you don't want nitrogen in your fuel because then you get NOx out of the process and that's, that's even nastier. Um, uh, well, we do see carbon and nitrogen m metabolism, right? We see it in, in the alkaloids uh, a lot. Uh, it just hasn't been so useful for us. It's obviously useful in a lot of important drugs. Your second part, um, how does the lipase transfer from the inside of bacteria to the environment? Does it need a translocase or? Yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, we think, although we don't know for sure, we think it's, the, the question is how do the lipids get out of the cell? Um, and uh, we think it's the same transporters that transport them in. Um, uh, there are uh, fatty acid transporters, uh, both for short chain, long chain, in organisms like E. coli. We probably should have, but didn't do the experiment where we knock those out and see if, if the lipids come out of the cell. Um, it's possible that they could diffuse out of the cell, but um, we know that the terpenes, um, the sesquiterpenes, diffuse out of the cell um, without a transporter. But I suspect there might be some transporters involved as well. So what Oh, there's already resistance um, to Artemis. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk about preventing that resistance from growing more. So the resistance to artemisinin that we see is, is primarily in Southeast Asia, um, where they've been treating it the longest and where they've been using um, monotherapies. Um, uh, by, uh, and one of the challenges has been to get countries to um, rely on the co-therapies because with co-therapies then you have less of a chance of resistance occurring. And that's happening in places, but increasing the availability of artemisinin is one of the best ways to do that. The other way is um, we're right now producing it in yeast and um, as we continue to improve the process the price will drop and it will drop below what farmers can afford to produce it for and therefore and the good thing about the the bacteria or the microbially produced artemisinin versus the plant derived artemisinin is that there are just a few producers and so we can control who gets access to it and if you can control who gets access to it, then you can essentially put the monotherapy producers out of business. It does not solve the resistance part. It just preserves artemisinin for longer. Yeah. There are, have been some drugs in the pipeline. There was a series of, they were called OZ, and then they had some number of drugs that were developed actually at the University of Nebraska. Um, and they had the uh, part of the artemisinin. Uh, moiety in there, um, but the latest one failed in clinical trials, in phase three clinical trials. So um, it's a little bit of a worry. Now, I have heard some, from some malariologists that when they've taken drugs out of circulation, antibiotics for about 10 years, and then reintroduced them, um, they've taken them out of circulation because there's resistance, and then reintroduced them, they seem to work. And so there's a chance that some of these older drugs based on quinine, that if they take them out of circulation for a decade or so, they can bring them back. 
Um, I don't have a target. I engineer chemistry inside cells. I'm not a drug guy. Some of your intermediates like FTP are fairly reactive. Yeah. Um, and they may break, right? Um, so then you get maybe toxicity products because they break. Yeah. How often do you think do you have kind of problems because of damage to your intermediates? Um, Good question. We know that they're toxic when they accumulate inside cells, whether it's IPP, FPP, GPP. Um, I don't know that we've tested how often they break. Um, yeah, I don't know that we've tested that. I suspect that, that the toxicity is due to things like crenellation of various proteins and other things. Have you tried to deliver those low-producing drugs into certain organelles, for example, to increase the yield? Um, it's a good question. Um, so you could produce drugs in organelles, and there are people working on this. People like John Duber at Berkeley are trying to engineer metabolism specifically in organelles to do some of these things, either because they're toxic or intermediates are toxic. I think it's got some great possibilities. I haven't done anything like that, but I think it's, it's got legs. Any other questions? Well, if not, please join me to thank Jay for coming to us.